Good morning and a good afternoon all. Uh, welcome again to the virtual 2020 AOCS annual meeting and expo live stream. I am Gérard Bayeli. I'm a man member of the board of directors of AOCS and incidentally, I'm vice president research and development for Procter and Gamble. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carol Treasure. She will engage us on the very exciting topic of non-animal testing. Dr. Treasure will provide a concise overview of which non-animal safety tests have regulatory acceptance, as well as the non-regulatory methods that can be used as a weight of evidence approach, providing valuable information for exposure-led risk assessment of consumer products or innovations that across AOCS we are doing. Dr. Carol Treasure is the founder and CEO of Excel R8 an animal free testing laboratory. Excel R8 conducts regulatory in vitro safety and efficacy tests for the global cosmetic ingredient manufacturers and retailer industry. Carol founded Excel R8 in 2008 with the mission to accelerate the world's transition to 100% animal free testing. And her company's work has been recognized at a regulatory level by the OECD and by very reputed bodies like Innovate UK and the European Union Horizon 2020. Dr. Treasure earned her bachelor's degree in physiology and pharmacology at Sheffield University. She received her PhD from the Frame Alternatives Laboratory at the University of Nottingham in the UK based on her work in the development of reconstructed human skin models for non-animal testing. Dr. Treasure has devoted her career to using innovative science to replace animal testing over the past 25 years, working closely with the leading cosmetic players in industries, manufacturing, suppliers, and retailers. The questions from the live stream discussion will be answered at the conclusion of Dr. Treasure's presentation. So it is my great privilege to uh, look forward to the conversation and to engage and introduce Dr. Treasure. Dr. Treasure, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, welcome everybody, wherever you're tuning in from in all the different time zones, wherever you are, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to spend some time um, just speaking about the topic of non-animal testing and really thinking about what we can do, uh, so our, our triumphs so far, and our remaining challenges, what we can't yet do, um, just to try to think about how we can ensure product safety, consumer appeal, and regulatory compliance. Just to start with, just to put into context, why are we thinking about animal-free testing? And for me, it's about improving human safety without making compromises on animal welfare on, or, or the environment. So can we have it all? Um, currently, we can't, but we'd like to get to the stage where we can. I know there's a variety of participants here today with different levels of experience. So I'd like to just give an initial introduction in vitro testing and to think about what I call the one R journey. So I'd like to start with a little bit of inspiration, hopefully. And if we think about the three R's, which are talked about worldwide, this is the reduction, refinement and replacement of animal testing. Accelerate's all about the one R, which is replacement. And if we look back just a few decades, really most testing, the vast majority of testing was being done in vivo in animals for cosmetics, but also across all of the other industry sectors. Then in the 1990s, around probably a bit before that, actually, but I was started doing my PhD in the 1990s. And at that time, there was a real shift towards a focus on the one R on replacement. And groups started culturing different cell types in vitro, um, derived from human skin, uh, derived from different human tissues. And at the time, that first attempt to replace animal testing met with a lot of criticism. 
and I can complete because those models are very simplistic when we're thinking about replacing a whole organism to predict human safety. But since then, over a relatively short period of time, a large number of new technologies have developed. On the right-hand side of the slide here, I'd like to show some examples, um, such as reconstructed models of human skin and the human airway, a variety of different primary human cells, which can be grown now without the um, inclusion of any animal-derived components, um, technologies like organ-on-a-chip, where we can create very miniaturized versions of different organs of the body, connect them up using an artificial circulation to start to really create a systemic model um, that can replace animal testing. And in general, just looking at this slide, what I like to really sort of take away from this is really that wow factor of how far we've come and what we've been able to achieve in science within such a short time. And when we look at the sophistication of the models and tools that we have available to us, why would we go back to using an animal which has such limited relevance to human physiology? And as I've pointed out on the slide here, it's well known that more than 90% of drugs which are tested on animals do later fail in subsequent human clinical trials. So even though the animal is used as the benchmark, which I will refer to later on in my presentation, that benchmark isn't necessarily a reliable benchmark. Now we're in a situation as an industry where we really want to encourage more uptake by all of the stakeholders because the technology is growing so fast and what we need to do is to be able to harness that and adopt it into strategies that can be accepted by the regulators um, and provide a better um, assessment for human safety. I'd also like to question whether alternatives are really still the alternative because so many of them now are fully um, accepted into international regulatory systems. I've always disliked the term alternative because it kind of implies that something might be a second choice, a second best. But actually we know that following extensive validation trials, a large amount of high quality data available and a high level of confidence internationally in using these methods. Just to set the scene then, um, we're keen on using in vitro methods to um, get approval for our new ingredients, our new products, our new chemicals that are being developed. And our framework for that is the OECD test guidelines program. And there are now a wide variety of non-animal tests with full regulatory approval for use in OECD member countries who have um, what we call a mutual acceptance of data, which means that if um, GLP compliant data is generated in one country, it will be accepted. And these tests really provide us with an exciting toolbox that we can use to run non-animal tests to achieve regulatory compliance. You'll notice throughout the presentation that I've included quite a few web links and that's because I want those to be available for you if you're looking at the presentation later, that you can actually click through and look at those resources. So I've added here a link to the human health endpoints, which are covered in section four of the, of the OECD guidelines program. Within that program, we want to look at which tests do we currently have, which we know can meet the needs of the regulators. Now, most regulatory frameworks around the world do require assessment of a very well-defined set of human health endpoints. And I'm going to start with the good news, the, the successes. Um, there are key human health endpoints that are required by the regulations for low tonnage chemicals. Those are chemicals that are only being used in limited quantities on an annual basis. And in the context of EU reach, that would be anything that is imported in a quantity less than 10 tonnes per year. That actually covers most cosmetic ingredients which are imported within that tonnage band, which obviously is very helpful because we have the cosmetics ban on animal testing. So being able to fit those ingredients in so that these 
test is, is extremely useful. So these endpoints are skin corrosion and irritation, eye irritation, insensitization, mutagenicity, and acute toxicity. And again, I've um, listed some live links here that you can click through for more information. But the take home message that I wanted to give from this slide is that for these key human endpoints, there are already a range of fully accepted in vitro tests within the OECD programme. And many of those use the technologies that were shown in the first slide, such as reconstructed human tissues, artificial membrane barriers, human cell cultures, etc. But I do think it's important just to consider what is truly animal free testing. And this is becoming a topic that is debated more and more now in, um, in industry, certainly here in, in the UK and uh, Europe. If we look at this list, um, these are technically described as in vitro tests. But there are some examples, such as test guideline 430, the transcutaneous electrical resistance method for corrosion. That actually involves the sacrifice of animals to perform that test. And in some countries, it isn't fully recognized as in vitro because of the procedures that are carried out on the animals prior to sacrifice in order to obtain the skin sample to carry out the testing. So it's not always as clear cut as, as we might like to think. Also, the test guideline 437 for eye irritation uses a bovine cornea, which is obtained as a waste product of slaughterhouses. So that's slightly different if we think about the, the ethical issues behind that. But the point I want to make is that it can be quite complex to define what we really mean by a truly in vitro or truly animal free test. This is just to complete the list if we're looking at the other endpoints. Um, so what I wanted to demonstrate here is that um, if we look at acute oral toxicity, that is currently the only human health endpoint for the lower tier um, tonnage of chemicals, which doesn't yet have a full regulatory test available. And we'll be coming back to address that a little bit later on. I've talked about defining what is truly animal free testing. And I think that this is something that um, it, it's a case where the different industry sectors probably have very different um, attitudes and there might be at different points on that scale. For the cosmetics industry, it's extremely important to have that total transparency on what we mean by in vitro. And does in vitro mean that it's a vegan test because many cosmetic products now need to be vegan compliant. And so to honor that philosophy throughout the product life cycle, the tests also need, need to be vegan compliant. So uh, we've published some work where we have developed a, a scale of animal free testing, starting from number one, which is live in vivo testing, going up to number seven, which is completely animal product free defined in vitro work. The reason we've developed this is really to aid transparency across the industry. And all of the tests that we do at Accelerate undergo this ethical assessment and then we can assign which level the test is at, um, and, and that then helps companies to decide whether it's a suitable test for them in the context of the product that needs to be tested. So that was just an introduction, and what I'd like to do is to give an overview of some of these in vitro technologies. Um, if we think first about skin irritation and corrosion testing, these are the well-established methods, really. These have been around a long time. Um, you can see on the slide here the corrosion test since 2004 and the uh, irritation test since 2010. These are very similar methods, and they involve tissue-engineered pieces of reconstructed human skin. You can see a cross-section of that on the right-hand side. These models are grown at the air-liquid interface so that they develop a skin barrier. And so the nice thing about these test methods is that we can actually take account of the human skin stratum corneum and any impact that might have on the irritation potential. So it's suitable for testing uh, ingredients and finished products. 
We can apply those directly to the skin surface. Um, and then we would measure um, at a single exposure time any damage to those cells, which then using validated prediction model, using a reference set of chemicals, then we're able to predict whether that chemical is going to be um, an irritant or a non-irritant, corrosive or non-corrosive. And at this point, I just wanted to look um, for comparison, just out of interest, at the different in vitro methods that are available for skin corrosion and how they stack up against the BRAVE test, um, which is the well-known animal test that was used for skin corrosion and still is used in some parts of the world. This table summarises the sensitivity, specificity and accuracy of each method. And if we look at the accuracy, we can see that we have a really good overall performance of these methods against the animal benchmark. I would just like to raise the point that um, these days, the, the validity of the animal benchmarks is questioned more. And it is known that those benchmarks are flawed. Those benchmark tests were never actually validated decades ago when they were adopted because at the time, that's all that was available. So there was nothing else to benchmark them against. And it's extremely difficult to obtain any human data on these kind of endpoints. So they kind of became the benchmark, the gold standard, if you like, by default. And I think that a validation of new in vitro methods against that default is initially useful because it helps to give us confidence that the methods that have been used over the years um, are reflected in the results that we're getting here in general. But I do think there are limitations in validating against the in vivo models because they are flawed in themselves. So if you don't get the results matching up, how do you know which method is correct? Um, and for that very reason, there's a lot of debate in industry now about moving away from the concept of a simple straight swap, a simple replacement of an animal test with a comparable non-animal test. And just thinking more about completely new, more innovative human-based approaches um, to validation and approving these tests. So I just wanted to give an overview. So if we move on to eye irritation testing, where well, I like to start the, uh, the tour of this slide is over the left-hand side. And if we take a look first at the um, BCOP test, the um, bovine eye test, um, then what happens is we take the bovine eye from the waste product from the slaughterhouse. Um, we don't actually conduct this test to Accelerate because it doesn't fit with our sort of ethical standards. Um, but those eyes would be taken and isolated and placed into a chamber and then any changes in the opacity or permeability would be assessed. But I think these pictures show nicely that if we just compare the cross-section of the bovine cornea on the left with a cross-section of the human corneal reconstructed model on the right, we can show that we can very accurately reproduce the structure, the physiology of that tissue in vitro. So we've got a good simulation of the corneal physiology and moreover, it's derived from human cells. So it provides us with a really nice human relevant system to use. Chemicals are again applied to the surface and the um, damage to the cells underlying are, um, uh, is assessed over time. Like any in vivo methods, the in vivo methods also have some drawbacks. And the current method uh, test guideline 492 with the human corneal model is only fully accepted as a standalone method if the result is negative and we show that there is no irritation potential. If, however, the result is positive and there is some irritation potential, then further testing is required to assign a category. Um, thankfully, these tests are evolving all the time and, and only a few months ago we had the approval of test guideline 496 which is just highlighted on the right hand side here. This is called the irritation kit. It's a, um, it's a synthetic barrier 
essentially, which is used to assess opacity instead of using a cornea. And that test is actually approved to assess either a non-irritant or an irritant classification, but it still isn't able to look at the subcategories, i.e. category one versus two. Now, when we're thinking about um, analysing the, um, the different endpoints, I think that skin irritation and corrosion are actually quite straightforward. They've been around for a long time. But when it comes to skin sensitization, it's a very, very important endpoint to assess because it results in a permanent condition. If an individual is sensitized to a chemical, then that involves a reaction from their immune system and they will have that reaction for life. But it's unfortunately a much more complex pathway to model in vitro. So I've shown on here this, the, the um, basic pathway of skin sensitization. There are a number of key events involved. Um, and as you can see from this slide, I've listed the tests on the right hand side, and there are tests available which match up with those key events. Now, we haven't got time to go into the detail of all of those today, but I'm just going to show a few more piece of information in the coming slides. But just to say that this was really a truly global effort to develop tests in vitro for human skin sensitization within the last decade, with tests being developed from Givaudan in Switzerland, PNG in the US, and Cal and Shiseido in Japan. Now the current regulatory guidance favors a two out of three approach um, using these tests. And that is employing the three regulatory tests that I showed on the previous slide. So the DPRA um, for um, key event one, the keratinocytes test for key event two, and the HCLAP test for key event three. And we may question why, why use two out of three? Um, well, the in vitro tests here are replacing a complex in vivo pathway, which is much more complex, as I said, compared with irritation. And we need to obtain an overall view of what's happening to that pathway, not just one part. Um, but in the process, what we get is advanced mechanistic data from each of those tests on the human response, which gives us a much more comprehensive picture of skin sensitization compared with the old animal models. There are new methods available, um, such as uh, the guard skin method, which is a genomic screen for more than 200 biomarkers. And we expect this test to be uh, to, to receive full OECD approval, hopefully within the next year. Um, I think I'll skip through these in the interest of time. This is just an example of um, skin sensitization results for a chemical. Um, showing the two out of three. So there were, was a DPRA test and a keratid, keratinocens test. Um, if those results are both concordant, then we don't need to go ahead with a third test, which is the HCLAT. If we had one yes and one no, then we would have to proceed to the third test. So let's just consider then, um, we've looked at some of the most commonly used in vitro tests that are well established within the test guidelines program. So let's consider how the tests are used to guide safety assessment. Well, thankfully, um, the OECD has in place a number of guidance documents called IATAs, which are integrated approaches to testing and assessment. And there are key ones available for the endpoints that we've discussed. Um, just to note, it's important that every ingredient needs to be assessed under these, um, these programs, um, and then that forms part of the overall safety assessment of the finished product. So the OECD guidance that's contained within these IATAs um, generally consists of three parts, and I've shown an extract here of the IATA for skin irritation and corrosion, as an example. The first part of that is to review all of the existing data that's currently available, and that might include a literature search, um, testing that's been done previously, there may be historical animal data available, um, 
and then also look at any in silico approaches. And then that's all brought together um, in the second stage, which is a weight of evidence analysis. From the weight of evidence analysis, we may be able to come to a, a firm conclusion about the irritant or corrosive properties of that chemical. If we're not able to come to a firm con conclusion, there may be uh, gap data gaps identified where additional testing is required. And that is where we would then go on to do the in vitro test that I've talked about in the early part of this, uh, of this talk. So it's not always the case that we need additional testing, but when we do, um, those are the tests that are available. Now, comes on to probably the less optimistic part of the talk. Um, what happens when there's no suitable regulatory test available? When we get up to chemicals which are imported and used in higher volumes than those that we discussed previously, so in most cases this would refer to chemicals that are imported in more than 10 tonne quantities in the case of bringing them into Europe. There are additional key human health endpoints that are required. Um, and these include genotoxicity, so additional tests compared to those that were required at a lower tonnage band, inhalation tox, repeat dose tox, reproductive and developmental toxicity, chronic toxicity, and carcinogenicity. We often find ourselves in a position where we don't have a regulatory test available for the work that needs to be done to generate um, data for that endpoint. Um, regulatory testing isn't always an option if there's not a test available or if an ingredient or product is for some reason not compatible with the test that we have. And in that instance, there are a number of things that can be done. And this is where the weight of evidence approaches really come into their own. Um, most regulations, fortunately, do allow for the use of non-regulatory tests to be used to support a weight of evidence approach. That is if they have undergone a certain amount of validation, and that's kind of validation with a small as opposed to an international validation trial. But if they've been demonstrated to be scientifically robust, they may have um, peer-reviewed papers, for example, or there may be a significant amount of in-house validation that's been done by the developing laboratory. Then there is some scope within most regulations to use those non-regulatory methods. And this is really positive because it does open up a larger number of possibilities to be able to build that weight of evidence for the product or the ingredient without having to resort to animal testing. Now, for the cosmetics sector, as I said, this is absolutely critical because we have the cosmetic uh, animal testing in place around the world. Um, but this is also increasingly important for other industry sectors, all of whom do want to avoid animal testing um, if it's not needed. Um, and there is increasing pressure from the public and from regulators to do so. Those evidence tests um, can't be used as standalone evidence, um, but they can be combined with things like historical data, read across from similar chemicals, and the use of in silico approaches. And as an example of that, I just wanted to come back to acute oral toxicity, um, which I mentioned earlier on. This is the only human health endpoint listed in Annex 7 of EU REACH. Um, i.e. that is required for a lot of um, cosmetic ingredients and yet there's no test available currently. One of the approaches which we've taken at Accelerate is to develop a human cell based non-regulatory screen where we've validated this. So far we've only done it for cosmetic ingredients um, and we've done an internal validation which has allowed us to come up with a prediction model to extrapolate to the likely GHS class for acute toxicity if we're looking at classes three to five, which are the less toxic classes which are applicable for most cosmetic ingredients. 
This allows us to come up with an in vitro equivalence of an IC50 value as opposed to an in vivo LD50 value. And whilst this is incredibly simplistic, it's not acceptable as a standalone test, it does provide a useful weight of evidence and is being used by ingredient suppliers. Um, the LD50 and related animal tests have come in for a lot of criticism internationally for both ethical and scientific reasons. And they themselves are a very simplistic approach to acute oral toxicity testing, which doesn't actually reflect what happens in a human in everyday life. So we're hoping that at least by shifting to using more sensible doses with human cells, that's one step along the way. But what we're trying to do is now actually we're seeking funding for additional work on this that we can expand out into different industry sectors and create a larger uh, reference database for interpretation of results. And eventually we would foresee this as being part of an IATA on acute oral toxicity testing, adding further tiers of perhaps organ specific tests if anything is flagged up in the initial screen. So that's human toxicology. Um, I did just want to make one um, short comment about ecotox, because if we're thinking about replacing animal testing for human toxicology, clearly we want to use, uh, move towards human-based in vitro models to represent human physiology in the closest way possible. And that, um, by definition, means moving away from animal tests. There's an additional challenge with ecotoxicology because obviously we need to have models that are going to provide us with a simulation of the species in the environment that could be affected. So currently, um, a lot of fish are being used, millions of fish are being used around the world every year for fish acute toxicity testing. Um, and the whole area of ecotox, I think, is a very difficult one that a lot of companies are currently trying to, to grapple with. And what we want to do is to protect the environment throughout the whole of the um, product life cycle without causing any suffering by conducting live animal tests. So some of the work we're doing at Accelerate is, uh, is that we are replacing uh, the current fish toxicity test, which is uh, these tests use adult and embryo fish with a predictive screen using long established fish cell lines. We didn't develop this test, we're just one of the first labs to be setting it up commercially. Um, but it's based on an ISO guideline, which we hope eventually will get OECD approval. And we feel that by using these well established fish cell lines, that both in terms of, of um, you know, in terms of the ethics and thinking about the ongoing use of millions of fish is that this is a really good um, alternative approach and it has been shown to have good productivity, good agreement with those fish tests that have been around for some decades. So I know we're running out of time. It's just been a bit of a whistle stop tour through uh, this topic today. Um, just to um, close just by saying that there is a definite trend at the moment towards exposure-led safety assessment. Many of the tests that we look at for um, ticking the regulatory box, as it were, you know, we need to have that say, basic safety data to get the regulatory um, approval. But those tests will really only give us a yes, no answer. Is something irritant or not? Is it a sensitizer or not? And what we're trying to do now as a, a testing industry is moving much more towards predictions of, of potency so how irritating or sensitizing is it? Not just a yes or no, but also looking at the likely exposure scenarios, and the context of product use. And many of the world's leading companies now are really embracing this by looking at a whole raft of in silico and in vitro tests, many of which are not regulatory tests. They're the weight of evidence screens that we've talked about. Um, using cell types from a wide variety of different organs and gradually piecing together a picture and a model for scenario of exposure in real life. So 
So we're kind of moving on from that, um, you know, yes, no, irritant, non-irritant, to really thinking about sort of a lot more sophisticated. So just to sum up, um, I think when we're thinking about using in vitro tests as an industry, we know that there are a number of advantages um, on the ethical side to address animal welfare concerns. Um, we know that consumer demand has led to a number of bans on animal testing for cosmetics in many countries, and that there's definitely a global trend, especially in the wake of COVID-19, towards ethically driven businesses. And I do think that these um, considerations do very much form a part of that. But animal testing uh, as an issue is very well um, sort of documented as part of the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. Um, SDG 12 is all about responsible production and consumption. And I do think that there is increasingly and more of a focus and more of a desire to combine new science with an ethical approach. Um, scientifically, we know that um, the in vitro model, models provide a closer simulation of human physiology. They can provide very specific and detailed information about mechanisms of action and toxicity on a cellular and molecular level. And what we want at the end of the day is to provide more accurate predict predictions in the context of humans not in the context of animal models. Many of the in vitro models are faster to perform, which can help to reduce that all important time to product launch for industry. Um, testing in vitro can also um, mean that companies can have access to markets with the bans in place, such as the EU um, in the context of cosmetics. Um, costs can be lower than the lengthy animal tests. Um, I've put a caveat there, it can be lower. It's not lower for every endpoint. For example, the skin sensitization um, test, because that involves three different methods, that isn't always cheaper than the in vivo testing. Um, environmental aspects, um, certainly something to consider, as I've said, and the in vitro tests do have a lower impact than animal test facilities which have a high energy consumption and um, are producing lots of waste products. So just to conclude, um, I hope I've been able to just give a bit of a, a whistle stop overview, as I said, um, of the variety of in vitro tests that are available now with regulatory approval using advanced scientific technology. They have an increased relevance to human physiology compared with the animal studies. And in vitro testing presents a number of ethical, scientific, commercial and environmental advantages. We do recognise that we are still a long way from our desired destination. But what I wanted to say about the endpoints that we don't currently have a solution for is that I do believe that with the huge amount of technical um, technological advancement that we've had in recent decades, that we do have the ability and the expertise within the scientific community to solve these issues. There are a number of industry initiatives ongoing to address those ends. Um, but I feel that more investment is needed, more collaborative approaches are needed. Um, and sometimes it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, as it were, because the regulators don't want to make a change until we have the tests available. Um, but actually sometimes having that regulatory pressure can mean that industry then um, pours a lot more investment into the development of tests to plug those gaps. So I do believe that technically it's coming within our reach um, and what we need to do is just to identify the investment and the collaboration that we can carry out. Um, and then our goal, as I said at the beginning, is that what want to do is to improve human safety without making those compromises on animal welfare or the environment. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been useful and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Treasure, for what is uh, both an inspiring and very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I would say just inspiring you. because you help us to reflect 25 years later 
the progress and the capabilities of animal free testing. And just seeing, you know, the journey as you describe it and where we are today, I'm sure is inspiring and liberating for all the audience and the AOCS. Um, we are going to make you work because there's, there are several questions uh, for you, Dr. Treasure. Okay, uh, I'll try my best. Very good, very good. Uh, the first one is, um, what is the best approach or advice that you will have for the industry when they have to convince regulatory bodies like the FDA to accept in vitro methods in lieu of in vivo methods? And excuse my French accent for in lieu, in lieu of in vivo methods. <laughs> That's, that's fine. Uh, well, that's a difficult question to start with, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think it's so important always to lead with the science. Um, I think there's definitely a place for all of the different stakeholders that are involved in this um, international effort. And uh, certainly... Um, you know, there are groups who are very focused on the ethical aspects of animal welfare and replacing animal testing. And, you know, personally, that's something that's of great importance to me. But I think that we have to make absolutely sure that, as I said at the beginning, we're not replacing an animal test with something that is somehow a second best. We have to ensure that the new methods coming through are better than the animal tests ever were, and to be able to demonstrate that with solid scientific data. Um, and, I, and I think that um, in my experience as well, there's a lot of uh, regulators who are really supportive um, of this whole effort, but they are justifiably nervous because they carry a huge amount of responsibility on their shoulders. And I think that there's also a place for training and education for people who work within those regulatory organisations so that they can better understand and interpret the, you know, the huge amount of data that's being presented to them. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Treasure. Let me ask okay. another question. Uh, looking forward, uh, you have shown that the potential of the toolbox of animal free safety tests is remarkable and pretty, pretty solid. Looking forward, what will be the one top scientific or technical area that you would like the scientific community and the industry to work together to develop? So what would be the next steps in this toolbox? If you had one wish, what would it be? Okay, <laughs> good question. Um... Oh, I have to select one. <laughs> um, yeah, I I may cheat a little bit because there's a, the human toxicology one is I would say is definitely the acute toxicity because it's quite remarkable to me that the LP50 related tests still in use. Um, so and so many animals are being used uh, around the world to generate an LD50 value that you really have to question, what does that mean? What does the LD50 value tell us about real life, small exposures um, to humans um, instead of uh, what's been described by ECFAM as more sort of suicidal doses because we're giving really high concentrations to the animals. And so I think that that is an area where we really need something that is more sophisticated. And as I mentioned, the screen that we've been working on, I recognise that's too simplistic, but I would like industry to kind of work together on something that's going to provide a more, you know, comprehensive approach. And then if I may, just uh, so that's the human side, but the ecotoxicology that I mentioned at the end, um, I think that's a huge challenge right now. Um, it, it, covers so many different aspects of the, the human journey at the moment from it goes beyond animal testing but also thinking about the environment and sustainability and I think we need to think about where we stand on that um, and to develop 
models that are not going to utilize a lot of animals to get those safety endpoints. Maybe computer modeling is going to help us with that too. Very good. Well, it looks like we'll have another 25 years journey. There are more questions, three questions coming um, on okay. the same line. F first, from your vantage point, okay, in the field of the cosmetics, um, this is an industry that wants to innovate to delight consumers. So the question is, do you see a lot of mm. new ingredients coming along every year that uses this animal-free testing? Or is it more components and formulations that rely on legacy animal testing base? Mm. Yeah, um, good question. I, I'd say the, the vast majority of testing that we're doing in our lab is for ingredients. So um, there is a responsibility on the ingredient suppliers um, who have to register those ingredients for REACH and other safety regulations around the world. And so they have to generate that, that data. And there's an expectation that they would use the in vitro methods as the, as the default. Um, and in Europe, as you know, they can only use the in vitro methods. I would say um, the cosmetics industry has been relatively slow to pick up the use of in vitro technology to test finished products. And I do think there's a lot more that can be done, for example, to use the three-dimensional um, reconstructed skin tissues. Um, they can provide an extremely valuable preliminary screen before going on to human patch testing. And we talk about the ethics of replacing animal testing, but actually we have to think about the ethics of human patch testing as well. And I think that um, tests for um, skin sensitization, certainly we don't want to go and put something that's sensitizing onto skin. I do think there's a real place for these tests to be used more in, in pro um, finished product testing. In our experience, even the larger companies have relatively limited budget currently for that. Um, most of it tends to be in ingredients. Very good. Have I answered Another question that is a technical question related to what you say. What IPS cell lines do you use in the, in the, in the progress that you were reporting? Um, we are using human. So we're we're using human cell lines. Um, so those those are um, obtained from. Um, There's a variety, so I'm just trying to think how best to summarise it. Um, for the keratinocens, keratinocens test, for example, skin sensitisation that is a. Um, specifically developed cell line that has a transfected gene in it that um, labs that want to do that test to buy that cell line under license from Givordan who developed the, the, the test. There's a couple of other similar instances um, that, that use a similar model and then with others we buy in human primary cells, so human primary keratinocytes, human dermal fibroblasts, and these um, all come with uh, ethical documentation. They were originally um, skin donors to tissue banks that have been approved either in Europe or in the US. Thank you. Very good. Let's move to the US. Uh, you know, the, the question for the US was in the 2007 report, toxicity testing in the 21st century. The yeah. US NRC lay out at the time a 20 year transition plan to adopt in vitro and in silico methods. With your vantage point, do you think that the industry regulatory are on track for realizing that vision by 2027? I think it's very ambitious um, to be able to achieve that, um, but I, I always feel that the goal needs to be set as a very clear focus and uh, something to aim for. And I think that we may not um, achieve everything we wanted to do um, by 2027, but if we had never set the goal, um, then maybe we wouldn't have made as much progress as we have currently. So I, 
you know, I, I do think it was a, a noble thing to set out to do. Very good. Well, you're doing so well. There are more questions coming, but uh, very, very exciting question. One question is to say, the computing power sciences has exponentially increased in the past five years, uh, enabling deep learning and more first principle modeling to be mm. available. What role do you see these data sciences, deep learning, modeling, and simulation to, um, uh, to provide against the challenges the US 20 year challenges or some of the things that yeah. you are aspiring to? Do you start to mm. see data science making a further in or, uh, being a tool for helping the next part of the journey? Yeah, I, I think. Um if I heard correctly, because the line was breaking off a little bit there, but I, I think if we're, we're talking about in silico methods and computer science. Yeah, um, let, let me rephrase yeah, that. Can I, you hear me? Yeah, I, you hear me? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the fine. question was more um, on the machine learning, deep learning and modeling and simulation, more on the mathematics than on the hardware. So do you see them offering new opportunities uh, to uh, Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that they definitely play an increasingly important role. Um, and, you know, as we move forward in the coming decades, then these these type of computer-based um, systems are going to play more and more important, uh, more central role. Um, but I do think we have to remember also that the that any computer-based models are only as good as the data that we put into them. Um, we have to educate that um, computer model and then to populate it uh, reference information and that reference information needs to come from real life testing. So I think that what we need to look at in the, in the coming decade or so is to really try to increase the amount of reference data that we have yeah. and that we can help the computer models to become more accurate. You nailed it, uh, Dr. Treasure. There is a lot of good people. There is a lot of computing science, but we need good data for this to work together. Yes. Terrific. Um, let's yes. back to the in silico. Okay. Are there some comprehensive and accepted in silico database available for toxicity evaluation in different categories? There are. Um, there there are a variety of in silico models that are available that are used. Um, they get used in the IATAs that I mentioned um, at an early stage where we're looking at the available evidence and then some of these in silico models are brought in at that point to um, where we describe the, the chemistry of the molecule and then see if there's any in that system to get some sort of information. And that is then um, that all goes together to help us to understand whether any new tests are required. And um, there are quite a large number of these um, tools available. Um, I would say I'm I'm not the expert on the in silico side, but if um, whoever's asked that question, if they wanted to follow up with me, then I can point them in the right direction um, to get more detailed information. We will do so. We will do so. A last question, maybe for the moment. Actually, I will have two questions. The question is, uh, it's um, uh, a quite a, a tough technically question. So let's see where we can go. Do you think that regulators might one day embrace a hypothesis-based weight of evidence approach? I repeat, an hypothesis-based weight of evidence approach. And between brackets, they are referring, the, 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 the question is referring to a, um, a theory promoted by Romberg. And they're asking, do you think this could offer advantages to current approaches? I do not know the Romberg model, but uh, that's the... No, I don't know about that model. Um, I, I would hope so. And I think it relates to the earlier question about what, how can we best work with the regulators and I think it involves a really collaborative approach so that everybody has access to the knowledge to understand how these systems work because I think if we just present 
that uh, if we just present that model and say we, you know, we we need you to use this, we want you to use this, there has to be more of a dialogue really to um, to educate and to understand how it works. But to me, it does make sense because what we're trying to do, as I said, is to move away from a straight replacement of an animal test with something else that is considered just a, an alternative to that to a completely new approach, you know, so that we can move on from the limitations of trying to compare new data to old animal data and embrace something that is much more forward thinking. Um, and and so I, I do think that it is heading that way, but I think it's going to take some time. Thank you, Dr. Treasure. I may say this is a very, very pertinent presentation for the AOCS to answer your question and your wish. Right. AOCS is made of industry, innovator, academics, regulators. So the questions are showing that, you know, the, your call for collaboration and trying to help the next frontier, oh. possibly we should be able to um, to lay, to keep, to, to build the momentum out of your presentation. I would like to finish with one question, and hopefully it's not embarrassing for you. When you look at yourself 25 years ago at the University of Nottingham, starting to embrace and participate to the journey of animal-free testing, how do you feel today? Do you think we have achieved as a society more than you expected 25 years ago, or are you frustrated that there is far more to go to do? I'm a, I'm an optimist. And I, you know, I, I like to celebrate the positive of what we've achieved. Um, I, I think that if as a young student, I had been able to see ahead 25 years and see the complexity and sophistication of the tools that are available to us now, it would have blown my mind, really, um, because um, what we started out with was a relatively small toolbox, and now we have this much larger selection of tools available to us. And I, and I do hear very often across the industry, um, you know, frustration or a sense that we're not moving fast enough. But really, 25 years is, you know, it's a, it's a small, it's the blink of an eye, really, in terms of, of our human history. And I do think that we have... Um, really achieved a lot in that time. And I, I'm just excited to see what's along in, in the next decades ahead. Thank you, Dr. Treasure. That was the, the last question. And thank you for uh, a pertinent, thank you. very balanced and uh, forward-looking uh, presentation for the AOCS um, members. Thank you again. Thank you very much and thank you everybody for participating and, and asking.